Signals intelligence, or SIGINT, is a pretty big topic. Intercepting the signals whizzing through the air is something that is not easy and historically mostly been relegated to militaries around the world. However, with recent conflicts around the world proving that a quick trip to a sporting goods store might be better than billions of dollars of military equipment, the need for the average citizen to start getting acquainted with the field of SIGINT has never been more important. Signals intelligence is really a broad term for several other types of intelligence. Under the SIGINT umbrella, we have comment or communications intelligence. That is, information related to adversarial communications that can be processed into valuable intelligence. Comment is usually what everyone thinks of when we talk about SIGINT. Wiretaps, stingray devices, ICOM chatter, or intercepted communications chatter, all of this is comment. Under the SIGINT umbrella, we also have ELINT, or electronic intelligence. This is mostly referring to SIGINT that isn't specifically related to communications. Things like radar signatures, aircraft transponders, GPS beacons, things like that. We also have various other INTs that sort of overlap with SIGINT at times. MASINT, or measurements and signatures intelligence, has a lot of overlap with ELINT in many cases. FISINT, or foreign instrumentation signals intelligence, has a lot of overlap with COMMENT and ELINT as well. And TELINT, or telemetry intelligence, has a lot in common with ELINT, such as for drone tracking or collections pertaining to ballistic missiles. As we can see, however we want to slice it, and with whatever new ints that they come up with to fill a resume bullet point, we're really talking the same language between all of these subsets of the intelligence field. And if you don't know what any of this stuff is, don't worry, we don't need to know the minute details to have a broad understanding that there are a lot of signals being flung through the air, and being able to intercept some of these signals is very helpful in a tactical environment for the average citizen. So let's take a look at an ultra-basic SIGINT collection setup that will add a lot of capabilities for most people. As always, remember that this is just one way of doing things that you can scale as needed. So what do you need to get started? First off, you really need some kind of computer, laptop, or tablet. Here in the shop, we really like old-school Panasonic Toughbooks because they are really easy to find all over the internet, and since the parts are very interchangeable, it's pretty easy to cannibalize parts as needed, or even build one from the ground up from spare parts. The other main benefit is ruggedness. These laptops, even long after their intended service life, are seriously durable tools. Almost all of the tough books that we have here in the office have tens of thousands of hours on them when we got them, and they are still going strong. The Panasonic line of Toughbooks also have some very unique features, such as a heating element for your hard drive. Very important if you're going to be operating in cold weather. Panasonic also has several lines of tough tablet PCs, which I personally have been working with for a while because they allow you to be vastly more man-portable. I can put this tablet in a chest rig and literally have SIGINT collection tools running as I am on the move, with no input for me whatsoever. The only other way I know of to get this same capability is to get a Windows Surface tablet. At some point I will be integrating one of these into my own setup because the processor is vastly better than these older devices, but for now I prefer a tablet that can run Windows right from a chest rig. Now I know what you're thinking, why not just use a phone or an Android tablet? Well the answer is pretty simple, processing power and the software. You can run SDR software from a phone. This is very popular. It, it can be done, and it is a great way to get started. But you will rapidly find out that a lot of the more advanced software is just too much for the processors on phones. And much of the software that we're going to be using is available for Windows only. Or the only reliable way to get various software packages to work together is to use the dreaded Windows operating system. I personally don't like it. I would much rather use Linux for this stuff, but in many cases trying to get Linux to work with a lot of this software is not that easy. Raspberry Pis are also another option that I wanted to mention, and I really think they're a great idea for some setups. So we will be examining these kinds of setups in the future because there's a lot more to it if you're trying to run a Raspberry Pi. But for most people just getting started, never having worked with any of this stuff before, just getting an SDR and plugging it into their laptop will be a great way to start. And speaking of, the next bit of hardware that we need is the SDR device itself. Software-defined radio dongles are pretty easy to find online and are usually pretty cheap. As of right now, the most common SDRs go for about $30 to $40 depending on inflation. Most SDRs are pretty similar, but there are a few that are more popular than others. The most common is the standard RTL SDR, which can oftentimes be purchased as a kit with an antenna to get you started. The other common SDRs are from Nuelec, specifically the Nestor Smart T versions. 
These are very handy for adding on Solberg filters and amplifiers without having to run external power. So if you want to eventually start receiving satellite imagery, one of these might be the SDR for you. But again, for an ultra basic setup, any SDR will do. Finally, we need an antenna. Your choice of antenna will be determined by what kinds of signals you want to receive. For the setup today, you will need two antennas. One antenna that is specifically for 1090 megahertz. You can find these online, sometimes in a two-pack paired with a 978 MHz antenna. The 978 MHz antenna is for receiving different kinds of signals which we will cover later, but for now, really you just need the 1090 MHz antenna for our purposes today. Technically speaking, you could probably just get by with unscrewing the antenna from your handheld radio if you have one, and just using that to see if all of this works together. But if you're really wanting to get the best possible range, you're going to need an antenna specifically tuned for 1090 megahertz, which we'll cover in a bit. The other antenna that you need is a simple VHF UHF whip antenna. Like I mentioned, this could just be the one that you unscrew from your handheld radio for just a second uh, to test things out but that's basically what you need. If you don't already have one of these, you can get these pretty cheap as well. I personally will be using a cattail antenna because that's what I already have routed through my gear, but you can use a simple whip antenna to get you started if you wish. Just make sure that you are getting the right kind of SMA connector. Your SDR will probably have an SMA female connector, so your antenna will need to have an SMA male connector, the side with the center pin. This is important because some VHF UHF antennas have this reversed for some reason. Once you have all of your hardware assembled, your laptop, your SDR, and antenna, we can start working on the software you need to make this stuff functional. So let's jump to the desktop and we'll take it from there. Alright everyone, so once we have our hardware and we've got our kit kind of set up the way we want it, now we can start focusing on the software. And this is going to be very easy, but we need a few different software packages to make this work. The very first software package that you need is SDR Sharp, which we can download right here. Uh, now I did want to show you how to download this because this might be a little bit tricky. Uh, if you click the wrong thing, you're going to be kind of frustrated. SDR Sharp comes in a few different versions, and what you need is this one, SDR Sharp with Community Plugins. This is going to make everything work a lot better. You can download the very first one that you're going to see on the page, but this is just the uh, SDR Sharp. A few drivers here and there, but no plugins. SDR Sharp with Community Plugins it comes with a whole suite of plugins that will make your life easier. As many people find out when they start playing around with SDR software, uh, none of this stuff is really easy to get to work together. And a lot of times what I have found is it's easier for me to just download the community plugin version and delete the plugins that I don't need or just leave them in. Uh, whereas if I download the regular version and try to manually put in plugins, sometimes things don't work so well. So always download the community plugins version, at least that's what I do. So just clicking download will allow you to download the file to wherever you want it to go. The next piece of software you need is a program called RTL 1090. And as we can see by scrolling down the page here, there are quite a few versions to choose from as well. Uh, you could go with the standard version right here, the very first one. Uh, version 1 right there, but uh, most people I think will probably be using this one, uh, which includes the installer and maintenance utility. Basically it's a uh, idiot proof way of setting this up. So this is usually what I use because I'm kind of dumb with setting up this sort of software, so this works out well for me. One thing to note though is that if you do not use this, you will need to configure this manually and you're going to need to uh, install uh, some other software to make that work. So if you wanted to go with the normal version, you can. Uh, you can just download it there. But if you go with the normal version, you're going to need this software here called Zodig. This is going to allow your SDR device to communicate with your computer. Basically, it's just a driver installer for your RTL SDR. Most SDRs, when you plug them into Windows, it's going to automatically recognize it and install the wrong driver. So uh, you need to manually install the right driver using this uh, program here. The reason that I wanted to mention this here is because if you already have experience using SDR software, chances are you've probably already done this and you don't need the regular uh, installer process. You can just download this version here. But if you're just getting started, you've never plugged your SDR in, go with this version. If you use this, you're going to be using this with a lot of other uh, software packages for SDR. So usually it's just handy to have that as well. And the last piece of software I wanted to mention is Plainplotter. 
Now, Plane Plotter, I should mention right up front, is a paid tool. Uh, you can use this for free for 21 days, but after that, you need to buy a license to continue using the software. I'm not a huge fan of this uh, for obvious reasons. We don't really want to rely on um, paid kinds of software that, that might have the potential for going down or offline uh, if we're trying to use this long term. However, this is really the best plane tracking software that I have found to use with ADSB tracking uh, platforms. This will make a lot of sense when I show you what you can do with Plane Plotter, and I might do a whole video dedicated to this software. Uh, but I did want to mention that this is not the only software you can use. There are other ADSB kind of virtual radar packages out there that display that can display your ADSB data. However, this one is commercial software. Uh, and it has a lot of very unique features that are not quite available in the freeware area just yet. So if you wanted to use something else, you can. I just prefer this one because it has uh, a couple of features that I'm uh, personally willing to pay for. But again, it's up to you. All right, so once we've downloaded our software, we should have three or four things, depending on which version we went with. Uh, we should have our STR Sharp installer. We should have the zip file from uh, RTL 1090 with the IMU. Uh, if you don't have the IMU part, you're going to need this software, the Zotig.exe, and also our plane plotter. So let's go ahead and start by installing SDR Sharp. It's a pretty simple installer. We just go through the process. Uh, we want to make sure to add the plugins, and you can select which plugins you want. Uh, I just choose them all because that's really the best way of doing things. Uh, I'm going to install this directly to the C drive uh, just because. RTL software tends to work better directly from the root directory of your uh, computer, right? So whichever drive you're wanting to use, you can install this stuff anywhere, but usually it's best to leave it in your root directory, just so you know. So SDR Sharp is going to be contacting the internet. It's also important to make sure that you have an internet connection for this. If you're trying to do this offline, you're going to have to install SDR Sharp using another connected computer to the internet and then dragging all, all these installation files over to the new computer that's offline. If you like to do things kind of air gapped that way like like I do a lot of times you're gonna need a thumb drive to transfer this stuff over because this installer package as we can see uses the internet to download all of the plugins that we need. Alright cool so SDR Sharp is done installing we're gonna go ahead and run it just alright so we're gonna get a couple of pop-ups here for one it's gonna open up a web browser uh, in the background to take you to the community installer page and this is going to show you all of the plugins that it just installed that's not necessary it just kinda of gets in the way you're also gonna get a Windows alert if you're on the dreaded Windows platform uh, to allow it access uh, to the internet we don't necessarily need that right now so we're just gonna cancel it not not necessary once you have SDR sharp installed there's a couple of different things you can do you can go ahead and use the Zodig application here to install the drivers for your SDR your actual uh, radio that you're going to be plugging into your computer or you can go ahead and go with the RTL 1090 setup so let's go ahead and do that uh, it's kinda simple either way so we can go ahead and close out SDR sharp for now bring back up our zip file for RTL 1090. We can extract this zip file. Let's go ahead and extract it here. Makes it a little easier and there's there's our exe for that. So RTL 1090 is our program that we're going to be using to intercept and process ADSB transmissions. So let's go ahead and install it. So now we have an installer which can install this program wherever we want to, right? It makes it a little bit easier than having to deal with command line kind of stuff to install RTL 1090. So we're going to go with a new install. And we can confirm the version that we want. Uh, the, we want the version for Windows Vista 7 and 8. Even though I'm on uh, Windows 10 on this particular computer right now, this will work just fine either way. Now we're going to choose our installation directory. And I, and I want to put it somewhere uh, different. I want to put it directly into the C drive. So... So once we've got C drive selected, we can click OK. And we are downloading everything. It's going through all of the processes to uh, download and install a series of software, uh, including Zodig, which uh, was downloaded before. OK, once we let RTL 1090 kind of do its thing, we should have a couple of things pop up on our screen. First one is Zodig right here. Uh, which, if it did not pop up, make sure that you uh, have actually allowed administrator access for it. You might have gotten a pop-up if it was on Windows. Uh, I know I did a couple of times. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. 
Now I should note that sometimes this doesn't always happen. Sometimes this Zodig menu won't pop up and sometimes it, uh, not even a notification will pop up either. If that happens, you might have to go through this whole process again and choose a different folder. Sometimes I've found that I've installed this on about six different computers by now and I have found that sometimes uh, installing RTL 1090 to the C drive doesn't, doesn't work uh, for some reason. Uh, it, I don't know why, it just doesn't. Uh, so you might have to install it to like your desktop, like just create a new folder on your desktop and install it there. Again, I am not an IT guy by any means, but a lot of this SDR software just kind of has a mind of its own sometimes. So uh, what you might have to do is install this to a different folder. But, but in any case, once we're here, we should be uh, in the home stretch. So we should have our Zodig popping up here on the screen, and we should also have and in the background uh, the RTL IMU installer trying to give us instructions. So can move this off to the side a little bit so that we can see both of these decently at the same time. And we are ready to configure Zodig. So uh, please insert your USB ADSB dongle now and cancel and ignore all messages asking you to install a driver package. So these are the instructions, right? Uh, this is trying to tell you to ignore what Windows is going to do, which is install a driver for the USB device. It's going to install the wrong driver. So don't worry about canceling. Just let it do its thing, and then we can work with it here later. So we're all good to go. I've plugged in my SDR to my computer, and now we're ready to start configuring Zodic here. So let's click yes. See, it's, it's kind of there. It's trying to walk you through this uh, Zodic configuration because you can uh, royally screw up something if you configure this wrong. So let's continue through it. All right, so here we go. We've got the first picture showing us exactly what to do. We go over here to Zodig and we click Options, click List All Devices. Now this is going to show all of the devices that are attached to our computer. Once we click Yes and we are here at the device list, we want to select the device that is Interface 0, Bulk In, comma, Interface, Interface 0. This is the one we want. Now, as you can see, I've already done this because I use SDRs on this computer kind of a lot, so we already have the driver installed. Basically, what Zodic does is it detects what drivers are installed and then installs new ones uh, depending on what you want. Now, the default configuration uh, is pretty good to go as is, but let's continue following the instructions here. We want to make sure that we're using the right configuration path, right? User ID, make sure it all matches up. As we can see, we want to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect. Uh, we should click reinstall driver just to make sure that we're all good to go. Once we click reinstall driver, there it's going to install a driver. Now the application is going to freeze for just a second, so you're going to have to give it just a, a second or two to think uh, because it will it will uh, freeze your whole computer for just like one or two seconds. I've noticed that it does that on every computer that I've got, so I don't know why, but it does. All right, so there we go. Our driver has been installed successfully. Close. We can make sure that we followed all the instructions. You can close everything out now, and we are ready to go. All right, so we've installed RTL 1090, and we are good to go, or so we thought. So this is where you might want to start bashing your head against the keyboard because things get really complicated and kind of confusing really quickly. This might be different for you, uh, but for me, while making this video, I have installed this uh, software on five different laptops, literally uh, every single time getting the same exact error, and that is that there's a missing DLL. So the, so the more astute of you might have noticed that once we went through the uh, RTL 1090 IMU, it failed to download a single DLL file for whatever reason. So if we were to go to our RTL 1090 folder, which is right here, this is the file that I install all that to, uh, we can see that we've got RTL 1090 right here, and if we could click the exe, we're going to get this error here, RTL STR .dll was not found, reinstalling the program may fix this problem. Well, what we need to do is find that DLL file, but fear not, there are instructions. Thankfully, this text file tells us exactly where we can download all of the missing DLL files. As we can see, we're missing two DLLs. We're missing rtlsdr.dll. We have this one, the msvcr100.dll. That one's right there. And we're missing the libusb-1.0 DLL. We're missing that one as well. So we're missing two DLL files that should have been installed, but for whatever reason, they weren't. And I'm not sure why this error keeps happening, but I've, again, like I mentioned, I've tried this many times and it happens every time. 
Now here's the, here's the unfortunate part. You can take this uh, URL and you can come to your handy dandy uh, web browser, put it in and you're gonna get a 502 bad gateway. Or at least that's what I get every single time I've tried this. And I don't know if this is due to the uh, Russian sanctions uh, due to the Ukrainian war because a lot of the RTL software is coming from Russian servers. I don't know if that's related in any way, but I've been getting this kind of a lot. Literally what I've been having to do, this is kind of the workaround for, to your uh, document here, find that file name this seems to work really, really well to kind of get around dead links a lot of times. Go back to Google, drop it into the Google search bar, and just Google it. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But as we can see here, it's from the same website, osmocom.org, that was in our uh, file here, right? So it's, it's the same website, and we click that, and we have our zip file. Now, I know this is really sketchy, but this is kind of the way SDR software works a lot of times. you got to go to really sketchy websites to get really obscure files to make your stuff work a lot of the, a lot of the times. And even though I'm following the instructions to the T, uh, it's not, it doesn't work a lot of times. So uh, this is the workaround that I have found, and once we download this file, once we click download, we can just download that zip file very easily get rid of all of this, come back to where we downloaded, and there it is, rel with debinfo.zip. All right, so once we extract that folder, we should get this one right here, which when we go inside it, we have two folders here. Depending on what kind of operating system you're running on, you can choose either 32-bit version or 64-bit version. Now, I should mention that I am running a 64-bit uh, operating system right now, but I have to use the 32-bit version for whatever reason. So if one version doesn't work, try the other and see if that will work for you. So uh, once we're in the 32-bit version here, in my case, I'm going to select the DLL files that I need. So I'm going to, head, going to go ahead and select rtl.str.dll and the other one, the USB DLL as well. Then using the analyst's favorite trick, control C to copy back to our RTL 1090 folder and control V to paste. So now we have all of the DLL files to make this uh, program work. And if we click the EXE, thank goodness, there we go, it works. So this is RTL 1090 working, good to go. If you click start, now our uh, software is up and running and we are already decoding uh, or starting to intercept and decode uh, message traffic. So if we go to our table here, we can now see the call signs of the aircraft that are flying overhead right now. Now, uh, one thing I should mention is, is that you can actually visualize this data with the latest version of RTL 1090. So let's go ahead and stop this for a moment. And let's go back to our internet browser where we can go back to the RTL 1090 page. Now, if you were to, once you have this all installed and good to go, you can go back and download this version, the RTL 1090 scope. All right, so if we downloaded the radar version with the scope on it, uh, all we have to do is extract that to its own folder here in our uh, same folder we've been working from, uh, just to make it, things a little bit cleaner. Uh, so this is what you get when you extract all that folder. You're gonna get your uh, DAT files for uh, displaying things like airports and navigational aids and stuff like that. Also your EXE files. So we're gonna, so we're gonna go ahead and drag all of these over or control C and control V them into the uh, destination folder. So we're going to go ahead and might as well replace the exe file. Doesn't doesn't really matter too much. And then we can start the beta version. I'm just showing you this version because now you can have kind of a radar set up if that's what you wanted. Now this is where you can stop if you wish and just kind of visualize uh, the aircraft as they appear around you. Now I know I'm moving kind of fast through this. Uh, the reason being is that this is not really necessary. This is a beta feature for RTL 1090, and it's it's pretty cool, uh, honestly. Rather than just having the, you know your table uh, or your your list of aircraft, right? Uh, you have them actually plotted on a map for you. That's really what we're going for, right? Uh, but within RTL 1090, this is not a super super useful feature. That's why we're using Plane Plotter because Plane Plotter talks to RTL 1090. So now that we've got an RTL 1090 all working and good to go, let's actually start using that with Plane Plotter.
One thing to remember before we proceed with installing Plane Plotter is to keep RTL 1090 running in the background. This is very, very important because we need information from RTL 1090 to feed into Plane Plotter during the installation process. Going back to our folder that we've been working out of, it's very easy to install Plane Plotter. We're just going to double click the exe file. Uh, you're going to get another Windows trying to protect you from something that it doesn't need to protect you from. Run anyway. Now the first pop-up you're going to get is uh, trying to tell you that the time for this particular computer is not as accurate. For a lot of SDR software, you actually need uh, time management software to actually make sure that your PC clock is hyper accurate. Uh, for multilateration, this is absolutely needed, uh, but we'll talk about that much, much further down the line. Uh, for now, we don't we don't need to worry about this for ADSB kinds of stuff. So we'll just go ahead and go through the setup wizard. So I'm going to go ahead and install Plane Plotter instead of to the folder I've been working out of. I'm going to install it to my C drive just because it tends to work better from there. But again, if it's buggy, you can move it to a different folder uh, to wherever it needs to go. So I'm going to go ahead and install all this stuff, clicking through it. No problem there. Go through all this stuff, install it. Cool, now we're done with the installation and we can run Plane Plotter. All right, so we get a pop-up saying uh, we've got our, we're on day one of our 21-day free trial. Do you wish to register Plane Plotter to keep using it? I'm not going to register it right now, but again, I would kind of recommend it, honestly, in the long run because I find that Plane Plotter has some features that I use uh, more than anything else. So again, you can register it later if you wish, uh, but for now, we're just going to go with the free version. And we're going to get another pop-up that talks about a Google map. Don't worry about that for now. Uh, we're going to be using the global base map. So we're going to click OK. And we're, it's going to give us the configuration menu for our SDR. So you want to configure Plan Plotter to, for your receiver now? Yes. Have you prepared and calibrated a local chart? No. Uh, it's going to tell us to choose globe.jpg in the next dialog. This is just to get us started. You can add in aerial, aeronautical charts uh, later on, but we're just going to use the global uh, one for now. So here's our globe.jpg. This is going to be our background for our chart. And there we go. We can see it's kind of loaded in the background there. Okay, now that we have our background map, uh, our chart ready to go, we're just using a simple globe default chart. Once we have that good to go, now we can start pulling in those feeds. And that's why it was so important for us to leave RTL 1090 running in the background. So, if we have RTL 1090 running in the background, we should still see that we're receiving packets uh, as aircraft are flying by overhead. That's all good to go. Um, we can minimize this or just kind of move it out of the way and start going through the plane plotter process. If you forget, it's okay, we can we can restart uh, this menu. Let's just say, for instance, we forgot and uh, we, we exited the kind of setup wizard here. That's perfectly fine. We can go back to help uh, setup wizard and run through the configuration uh, again just to, you know, choosing our globe again, and now we're back here to the same menu. This is very helpful in case you, you know, get kind of tunnel visioned and start clicking a bunch of stuff, because we're about to start clicking a lot of uh, dialog boxes that pop up. And the first one is Plan Plotter wanting us to connect to some data. So the first question it asks us is, do you have a receiver connected to your PC whose output you want Plan Plotter to process? We click yes. The next question is, do you have an ADS-B mode as receiver? And then it starts listing all of these different receivers. We're going to also click yes to this one. Now we're going to click no a bunch of times because we don't have, uh, it's trying to find out exactly what receiver we have. So we don't have the Kinetic SBS-1, uh, we don't have the Air Nav Radar Box, Plane Gadget. We're going to click no until we get to, uh, it's just after AVR receiver I think, yes until we get to RTL dongle. Do you have an RTL dongle connected? We're going to answer yes to that one. And the next question then is, is the dongle connected using RTL 1090 utility? Again, the answer is yes. Check the IP address and port for 10, RTL 1090 and then press OK. So, so we bring up our RTL 1090 and we see what port we're on. In this case, we're on port 31001. And we can leave that running. Press OK and type in, see it's, it's going to default to the wrong port, so we want 31001. Then click OK. 
All right, so start RTL 1090, processing the signals from the dongle, and press OK. All right, cool, we're already doing that. Plan Plotter is now processing your chosen input. Next time you run, remember to click the green button to start processing. Okay, cool. So now, Plane Plotter is working. Okay, now that we've got RTL 1090 running in the background and Plane Plotter is all installed and good to go and everything's working together, uh, we need to do a couple of things to get Plane Plotter to work. The very first thing that we need to do is update our home location. So. Uh, for me, this default spot right here in uh, Arkansas is what populated as the home location. That I obviously don't live in Arkansas, so um, what we're going to do is go to Options, Home Location, Home Location Setup, and you can put in your GPS coordinates here. It doesn't need to be super precise, but you do need to be kind of close to your actual location wherever you're going to be. This is super, super, super important because otherwise your aircraft are not going to be plotting in the right spot on your map a lot of times. Once you get that done, you can press your green button up here and aircraft should start appearing on your map as they are being uh, intercepted by your SDR, being processed by RTL 1090, and running from plane plotter. Now let's talk about some of the features that you can set up to actually use this in more of a tactical environment if you wanted to. One of the things that makes this software package really cool is the ability to set alerts. So let's just zoom in here to Arkansas and I'll refresh my map right here really quickly, get a nice crisp image. And let's go ahead and add in some alerts. So I'll go to options, alert, we'll make a, let's make an alert zone here. I'll add one and I will draw a nice little circle-ish around my site. Go back to options, alert, alert zone, and I will save that. What you can do is set up these alert zones so that any aircraft that flies inside this circle, you get an actual alert tone, you get a notification. Uh, you can set this to be a custom notification if you want. That's very handy for some people, but for me, uh, I think that this is probably a little bit more of a simplistic thing. If you live in an area with a lot of traffic like I do, there are aircraft everywhere filling the skies basically around my location. What you might want to do is instead of setting up zones like this, which you can you can play with on your own, uh, what you might want to do is instead of using these alerts here, go down to conditional expressions and add an alert conditional expression. Now what this will do is it allows you to set very specific parameters that will trigger an alert. So for example here, in this example, if the aircraft's range is less than 20 uh, nautical miles and the altitude is less than 10,000 feet and the flight number is equal to whatever number you want it to be, it will trigger an alert. So let's go ahead and get kind of a rudimentary one going here. Let's say, let's use the range again. Let's say range, double click it to add it to the thing, or you could just type it out if you understand the, the logic here, is let's say range is less than, 10, let's see, and the, let's go back and say altitude, altitude is less than 10,000 feet, that will be our notification. So if I were to save this, which I can do right now, let me bring it back up there to talk about it a little bit, this will send me an alert if an aircraft appears within 10 miles of my location, meaning that if they are less than 10 miles away from me and their altitude is less than 10,000 feet. I can also add in a few other parameters such as different call signs and tail numbers and things like that if I wanted to. Uh, but for the most part, this will probably get you going really, uh, really good. So uh, this is a very simple conditional expression so that you can basically have this running either on a Raspberry Pi or on a small tablet and you can be walking around doing your thing and when your antenna picks up an aircraft that is less than 10 miles away from you and less than 10,000 feet in altitude it will send you an audible alert. Very very handy because in most cases I don't really care about aircraft that are you know passenger aircraft that are flying at you know 35,000 feet not really interesting to me however if there is an aircraft that's you know kind of close to me and it's also flying beneath a standard you know air corridor that's interesting to me and I might want to know about that so using conditional expressions you can be a lot more 
tactically capable in understanding what is going on around you and also be jogged to understand when you uh, get aircraft in your specific area. And you can also set these conditional expressions for other things as well. If you were to bring up the conditional expressions menu, you can decide what aircraft even make it onto the map. If you don't want to track every single aircraft that you, you can pick up with your antenna, uh, you can set conditional expressions to dictate which aircraft even show up on your map in the first place. That might be handy if you like live near an airport and you don't really care about 90% of the traffic that's flying around uh, all the time. Uh, but you are concerned about some of those aircraft, you can set conditional expressions to be very specific. You can also set conditional expressions to decide what gets displayed uh, in logs and lists and things like that. So very handy for kind of sorting down, especially in high traffic areas, what kinds of aircraft you want to see. One thing that might be also very handy for you if you're using alerts is to set what parameters or what data gets displayed with an alert. So for instance, let's go here to Options, Alert, Alert Fields. Now, this is the information that will be displayed on your screen when an alert goes off. This is the default configuration here, and I can change it however I want, right? So I'm not really so concerned about the hex code. Uh, I do want flight number and registration though because the flight number will tell me what airline uh, the aircraft is working with and registration if the aircraft is not part of a uh, formalized you know, airline, commercial airline, it, it will tell me uh, what the registration of that aircraft is. Uh, very handy. Uh, you can put the time tag as to when you receive the alert as well, the speed, all kinds of stuff. Alert origins, very handy to tell you uh, what kind of alert it was that, that triggered uh, you being notified about this. But one thing that might be very handy to have is adding an altitude so that it actually displays the altitude of the aircraft. And also range. It will tell you how far away that aircraft is. So, you know, you get a notification sound you know, from your speaker or in your earbud. You can look down at your tablet screen and see the notification which tells you everything you need to know. What flight number it is, uh, if it's not a commercial aircraft, what registration it is, uh, how far away it is from you, and its altitude. Very, very handy information to have at a quick glance. Something else very handy to display on the screen if you wanted to are range rings. So let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit here. Uh, to our current home location, refresh our map to make it nice and crisp again. And let's go to the map settings here. Now this chart options uh, menu looks really busy and it kind of is, but we're just going to go down here to the bottom where it says range rings. We can put them around our home location and let's put them out, let's say, let's say 50 miles and click OK. There we go. Now it just drew uh, range rings 50 miles out, at one ring every uh, 10 miles obviously all the way out from our location. This is what most people will probably use because usually if you're talking about a, a man uh, portable uh, ADS-B receiver setup, you're not gonna be able to pick up aircraft more than say 50 miles out or so uh, in any direction. Uh, if you're living in an area where you can get a very high antenna up or you're in uh, some, some high elevation areas, you can certainly get much more. You could probably cover a significant portion of the United States with just your small uh, receiver. But in any case, this will work quite well to show you at a quick glance how far out a specific aircraft is. Something else that might be very, very handy for you to add in is your polar diagram. Now this essentially shows you how far out your receiver is picking up aircraft, basically in real time. So it shows you which aircraft you're able to receive. Now to set this up, let's go ahead and make things less confusing by let's get rid of that alert and clear that out. So now we've just got our range rings and our home location. To set up our polar diagram, it's very, very simple. Just go to view, it's not under options, it's under view, polar diagram, and then click plot max range. Now what that will do, if you have aircraft being plotted on your map, you will start to see a shape being drawn. And if you hold still for long enough and you know don't move your antenna around a little bit, it will start to calculate based on the aircraft that it can hear how far out you can actually receive aircraft. Now normally when I you know, turn on the uh, polar diagram, what I will do is leave the antenna in place and leave this entire setup running for about 24 hours or so to allow air enough aircraft to fly by that it plots exactly what the ranges are. So 
So after a while, you should have something that looks kind of like this, this kind of like explosion style graphic. And this shows you how far out your receiver can pick up aircraft. And this will update in real time as you pick up more and more aircraft and as you move to positions where you might not have such a good view. So you can literally walk all, all day uh, up and down mountains and at a moment's notice know exactly how far out you can hear aircraft if they were in the air. That's very, very handy because a lot of times in the radio world, we don't actually know how far out we're transmitting or receiving, right? We might be behind valleys or things like that, and we don't necessarily have the time to conduct line of sight analysis for every step that we take along a trail. This software, being a very capable professional grade software, will do it automatically for you in real time. So it will allow you to understand exactly how far out you can hear aircraft at a moment's notice. That is very, very handy to me, and this feature alone makes it worth it uh, over some of the other freeware applications out there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we are in the home stretch now. We are almost done with our basic SIGINT setup for now. To wrap things up on the software side of things, let's go back and add in a simple plugin to SDR Sharp and configure it so that it can work as a scanner. This is a lot easier than configuring some of that aviation tracking software. All we have to do is bring up our SDR Sharp uh, menu here, and as we can see, this is just kind of the, the base menu uh, that you're going to get when you launch SDR Sharp. All we have to do, again, if we have loaded in the community plugins version of the uh, software, all we have to do is go to menu and search for a program or a plugin called Frequency Scanner. There we go, we've located Frequency Scanner in our plugins list. All we have to do is click it and it will open up the window and kind of launch it for you. There are far better scanning applications for STRs. Uh, this is arguably one of the simplest and easiest to use though, so it will kind of get you in the understanding mode of how this stuff really works. So all we're going to do is go over here to Edit Scan Ranges, click that, and it will open up the menu for us here. So let me go ahead and delete this one so I can show you uh, what you'll see when you open it up for the first time. And really all we're going to do is start adding in scan ranges. Remember, this is a very basic, very basic setup for uh, scanning with an SDR uh, if you don't have a, a traditional handheld scanner or something like that. So what we're going to do is just do the ultra basic stuff and program in a couple of different uh, frequency ranges. And the first one we'll do is just the 2 meter ham band. So we'll start at, uh, we have to put this in in hertz as you can see here. So just how it is in SDR Sharp if you kind of forget how to convert megahertz to hertz. It's very simple. So. 144, there we go, and we'll do the back end of the VHF uh, 2 meter uh, ham band, there we go, and we'll keep the detector the same, that's the narrow uh, band FM, and since we're doing narrow band kind of stuff, I want to keep this a little bit more narrow than it needs to be, honestly, and we'll keep the bandwidth at 5000 along with our standard uh, steps at 5000. Uh, for most of your ham bands, I, for VHF and UHF, for 2 meters and 70 centimeters, I'm pretty sure the step size is basically uh, 5,000 hertz or 5 megahertz uh, on both of those bands. Uh, the bandwidth can vary. This is much more narrow than it needs to be. Uh, but I want to make sure that I'm covering everything that, that might uh, be slightly off frequency. Remember, a lot of the people that I'm going to try to be listening to are going to be probably uh, shifting their frequency quite a bit or they're going to be wandering off of the frequency that they need to be because they're using um, radios that are not quite up to FCC standard. So um, there we go. We've got the 2 meter ham band in and let's go ahead and put in 70 centimeters as well. This is going to take care of most of our uh, VHF and UHF communications in the United States. Again, the bandwidth here and the step size that I'm going with is a little bit more narrow than, than it needs to be, but that's okay. Uh, basically what I'm doing here is setting up this scanner to allow me to scan both the VHF and UHF ham bands uh, for any kind of communications that people are going to be transmitting. So roughly this, this simple scanner and this simple uh, scan ranges I've set up here are going to be able to detect the vast majority of communications that are going to be out there. So there we go, we've set up our uh, scan ranges, we can click OK, we can add as many as we want, but now we have them over here in our little menu. And if we were to go ahead and click play, we would see the scanner begin and scan away.
So let's recap and take a look at this basic setup in its entirety. On the hardware side, we have some basic gear. We have our laptop, or in this case, a tablet running on the Windows operating system that also has a USB port. Plugged into that USB port, we have a generic SDR dongle, which also has an antenna attached that is the proper antenna for what kinds of signals we want to listen to. Chances are you will need multiple antennas for different frequency ranges. In this case, we're using an antenna that is resonant on 1090 MHz, and we're also using a flexible WIP antenna that works on VHF and UHF frequencies. And we can swap between the two antennas as the mission requires. If we want to listen to aircraft, we leave the 1090 MHz antenna installed. If we want to start scanning VHF or UHF frequencies, we will switch to a VHF or a UHF antenna. On the software side of things, we are running SDR Sharp because it's a very basic software package to get started with, and it has a lot of plugins that we can take advantage of, such as simple scanning, logging, and recording plugins. We are also running RTL 1090 in conjunction with Plane Plotter to not only visualize aircraft overhead, but also track and log them, and even send us audible alerts when specific aircraft fly overhead, or specific parameters are met. With this setup, we can eliminate a massive problem with SIGINT, which is not knowing how far out you can receive aircraft. If you are hiking along a trail and slowly find yourself coming into restricting terrain, you might look down at your tablet and not see any aircraft on the map. So you might think, oh, there just aren't any aircraft flying around overhead. But in reality, it's just the terrain masking your ability to receive their ADSB transmissions. With Plane Plotter, you will know at a glance exactly how far out you can receive aircraft, and this will update in real time as you travel. So you will always know whether or not the lack of aircraft is really due to a lack of aircraft or because you can't pick them up due to terrain. And finally, we can add in some software that I have left off until now, which is Artemis by Ares Valley. Artemis is a simple bit of software, but it adds a lot of capability. In short, it allows you to identify what kinds of signals you can pick up on your SDR. A lot of times we're not going to pick up just voice transmissions, in most cases we're also going to pick up strange signals that we might not know what they are. Artemis is a digital library for hundreds of signals, which you can use to audibly compare and contrast whatever signal you detected. You can also see what the signal looks like on a waterfall. Simply put, Artemis will help you figure out if that signal you heard is an encrypted handheld radio transmission or a QPSK modem used by the Iranian Navy. And since this program pulls info from SIGIDWiki.com, this will continuously be updated as more and more people contribute to this project. And in the future, I would hope for a plugin or something that will allow us to automatically identify signals and get a notification without the end user having to do anything. It would be pretty handy to get a notification like this. Warning, fire control radar detected, bearing 315. We're really close to being able to set this up, and I would expect that several people are already working on this feature or something like it. Stepping away from SDRs for a moment, if we want, we can also bring along a handheld scanner, which will dramatically increase the convenience factor, and also retain capabilities when your SDR is occupied. Remember, SDRs oftentimes can only be used for one thing at one time. So if you are scanning the band with SDR Sharp, you can't track aircraft at the same time. It's one or the other. If you wanted to, you could have a base station set up with a laptop that has multiple USB ports for multiple SDRs, but this is what I would consider pretty advanced and it's not that easy to do, but it can be done if you so choose. I myself find it's easier to just run one SDR plugged into one tablet doing one thing. Usually I'll leave RTL 1090 and Plane Plotter running, logging all of the aircraft that fly overhead. And to monitor radio traffic, I'll just run an independent scanner. In my area, I need some pretty advanced P25 decoding capabilities, and since decoding P25 public service traffic is pretty taxing on an SDR, I tend to just listen to local traffic with a dedicated scanner that does it all at once. But just getting started started with an ultra basic setup using scanner utilities on SDR Sharp is pretty effective. And as you get into the SDR game a bit more, you can get more capable SDR receivers, which can view basically the entire spectrum at once. But that's a bit advanced and something we'll talk about in future content. There is an old phrase that goes, he who builds a house according to every man's advice will have a crooked house. In the communications and SIGINT world, a similar idea exists. That is that he who builds his radio network, according to every man's advice, will be ineffective at communicating and go broke buying unnecessary gear in the process. 
So please remember that there are infinite ways of doing things, in most cases, so many ways of getting to the same goal that it's overwhelming and frustrating. Within the world of communications or SIGINT or anything along these lines, it's probably a good idea to start with your end goals, what capabilities you need, and work backwards from there. Now, if you're using this setup that we've talked about today, someone can ask you, hey, what SIGINT capabilities do you have? And you can reply, I can intercept ADSB transmissions and track aircraft, and I can also scan whatever frequencies and identify whatever signals you need me to. That's a much better answer than replying, what is SIGINT? Finally, start small. Being able to intercept simple radio traffic around you and being able to track aircraft overhead is a huge advantage if you previously had nothing at all. You're going from nothing to something. And this is a good base to work from when we start talking about more advanced stuff. But for now, this tiny peek into the world of SIGINT will get us started, and more importantly, get motivated to go from zero SIGINT capabilities to something useful. Thankfully, SDR devices are pretty cheap and plentiful, even in times of shortage. And most of the software is free, or have free versions of it, so you aren't risking much by trying this stuff out. So try it out and see what works for you. If nothing else, these capabilities will allow you to, more easily, fight in the shade.